of. And clearly, collectively, we are a very large and diverse workforce. And together, we aim to celebrate our diversity and promote inclusivity in all of our employment practices. So today's event has been organised from the ICS's Race Equality Steering Group and the wider Black History Month Planning Group. So just before we start, I'd like to ask those involved to briefly come on camera and let everyone know who you are. So if we could have colleagues from Nottingham City Council, introduce yourselves. Uh, hi, my name's Dar Stacey from Nottingham City Council. I'm an equality lead. Fabulous, thank you. Um, Nottingham, I'm from the CCGs. Got colleagues from the CCGs here. We've hopefully we've got colleagues from Nottingham City Care. Hi, nice to meet you. Nottinghamshire County Council. Hi everybody, my name's Tarage. Um, wonderful event, really looking forward to it. Um, and I'll speak to you soon. Nottinghamshire Health Care, colleagues. Thank you. Nottingham University Hospitals, colleagues. Hello. Sherwood Forest Hospitals, colleagues. I'm sure you're there. Hello, welcome. Primary Care Network of representatives. Have we got, we, we, we've got colleagues from the Allied Health Professionals Cabinet and last but certainly not least, the Nottingham ICP BAME Health Inequalities Subgroup. So thank you all of you for the work that you've put into making this event what it's going to be. So before I do get started, I'd also like to thank on behalf of the ICS partners, all of the people, the unsung heroes and heroines behind the scenes who have made this creative media extravaganza possible. So just to name check, Scott Turner, Sue Stronach, Rashane Oliver and the multimedia team. So to get into the event, what is Black History Month 2021? It runs through October and it's an annual celebration of the contribution that Black, African and Caribbean communities have made both locally and across the world. And this year, as an integrated care system partnership, we're offering this event as an opportunity to celebrate the contributions of all people of colour. And we are coming together in unity against racism, prejudice and injustice. As a result of the Black Lives Matters movement and the global outcry against the racist death of George Floyd, we are seeing positive change as systematic racism is challenged and addressed. But for many, it isn't soon enough and the challenge isn't strong enough. But as an ICS, we are committed to challenging and addressing all forms of discrimination. And we've agreed race is our immediate priority. Progress has been made, but there is still a long, long way to go with people of all colours, ethnicities and nationalities working together to achieve this important goal, which is why this event we are proud to be is about coming together to celebrate all people of colour, valuing and showcasing some of our unique cultural identities, but also the many things we have in common, which is fundamentally a desire to be treated with dignity and respect, and valued for who we are whilst recognising the richness we bring to society. So through a combination of live presenters and broad mater um, recorded material, I hope we will be able to give a really good flavour of what that value really means. So to open the event, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a short film containing contributions from staff and community groups across the city and county, along with a special appearance from Richard Brindley, who is a highly respected player from our very own Nottinghamshire County uh, Football Club. So I'm going to hope the first video uh, can show now. Sure, it's on its way. What inspires you? My religion, my family, my granddad, my teacher, and my friends. My big 
Proud to be a mixed race woman. What's up guys? My name is Richard Brindley. I am a professional athlete and I play for Notts County Football Club. Who inspires me? Okay, I'm going to go with Jay-Z, the musician. The reason why is because, let's not forget, Jay-Z's come from absolutely nothing. And he's gone on and created so much for himself. It's incredible to see. But he's not only become successful as a musician, he's also become successful as a person. He's been able to do the unthinkable or do what seems un impossible and create and uh, develop a new mindset, new skill set to, cr to create and become more in, in different areas and in different industries as we've seen him become a successful businessman today. So for me, that's influential to see someone not only do it in what is seen as your lucky in or just skill naturally skillful in he's also gone to show that he's worked exceptionally hard and become good at something that he wasn't or didn't necessarily have given to him at the start or naturally had as a gift so it just goes to show that um you can do and become anything you you set your mind on so um yeah for me it's, it's jay-z what are my ambitions for me, I want to be successful in everything that I do. And when I say that, that's not just, you know, financially. If anything, that's at the bottom of the list. I think that comes with, with the mindset and skills that you create. But it's more so the case of whether it's being a sibling, whether it's a parent or whether it's me being a footballing teammate, I want to be the best version of that. I want to help others. I want to influence so many people and, and create changes within the world. I want to put myself in a position where I'm capable of doing that. Um, so yeah, as a whole, I, I, I don't want to waste a second on this earth, I want to do as much as I possibly can and help as many people as I can and, and um, create as many positive changes as, as I can. So that's my main ambition is, is simply being not just comfortable or good. I want to become great at what I do or great in who I am. So that for me is, is, is my main ambition. Thank you very much. I think you will agree that's a great start um, to this session. So um, hope, what I'm hoping to do now is to hand over to our first in-person presenter and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Marie Gabrielle, CBE. And Marie is the current chair of the NHS Race and Health Observatory. And among other key roles, she's also been chair of the North East London Integrated Care Board. Outside of the NHS, Marie took up her first director level role at the age of 23 and subsequently worked for over 20 years in senior executive roles within local government, housing and the third sector. She's also provided management consultancy for the public and third sectors, specialising in working with boards at times of crisis. And Marie has a number of honours, including freedom of the London Borough of Newham, incorporation on the health service journals, inaugural in inspirational women's list and the Tony Cheeseman Award in recognition of her contribution to equality and the communities of East London. She also received her CBE and the Queen's 2018 birthday honours for her services to the NHS. So I'm absolutely delighted um, that Marie is now going to uh, start our live presentations. Thank you very much for that um, uh, introduction. Um, and I just wanted to start by saying I love the theme of this year's Black History Month, Proud to Be. I think it provides a distinct opportunity for us to turn the focus on ourselves, to share our own stories as the people who are making history now and creating change now in a myriad of different ways. 
So the stories of this month are personal, and I'm happy to be that whilst I'll, I explain to you why I am proud to be. So the first thing I want to talk about is how I am proud to be the daughter of a Caribbean man who equipped me with a pride in my heritage and an understanding of my rights and how to navigate racism. My dad was in the Merchant Navy and he would send us letters telling us about inventors. Letters that said, did you know a black man invented the free light traffic light? His name's Garrett Morgan, I can still remember that. And that a black woman, Mary Van Britten Brown, um, actually that invented the common features of home security systems that we have now. And he made sure we remembered that because he used to test us when he came back home from sea. He ensured that we honoured and remembered the contribution and compliments of black and minority people everywhere in all kinds of fields. More than that, Dad also had those difficult conversations that we have to have about racism and inequality, how they might impact on our lives and how we stand, must stand up for ourselves and how we can do that safely. The first book that Dad brought me as a young adult was Women, Race and Class by Angela Davis. You can tell from the Dad's choice of book that he ensured that our commitment was to the wider equality agenda. I am proud that I recognise that everyone has a unique experience of discrimination and oppression and that we have identities that overlap. I recognise that I cannot be a true advocate for race equality if I don't understand other marginalised groups are equally support, don't ensure, sorry, that other ma marginalised groups are equally supported in their struggle. We as black people also experience discrimination and disadvantage because we are gay, disabled, women, trans and working class. I'm proud to be an activist for equality and social justice and to made that part of my career. For me, this has specifically been about race. And, and, and in the introduction, you've heard that my first job as a director of an anti-racist organisation, through to working in the, in the NHS as an anti-racist, including chairing the Workplace Race Equality Scheme Advisory Group, and my current role as the chair of the Race and Health Observatory. I use the term anti-racism with intent as it moves you to action, action to eradicate discrimination. I'm proud to be a leader who recognises that it's not it is not my big black and minority ethnic staff that I need to change through training, learning and development so that they are better able to cope with the unequal world that, that we exist in. But it is the organisation that I lead that must change to ensure equity and to maximise the benefits of inclusion for all staff and to maximise quality of services for the people who use our services and to ensure we have the best use of talent and resources. Importantly, I am proud to be held to account and to hold others to account for achieving equality, um, learning from best practice and supporting development. I am proud to be the chair of the Race and Health Observatory, which has been established by, as an in, proactive investigator of health inequalities experienced by black and minority ethnic communities. At the observatory, we provide evidence-based practical recommendations to inform changes to policy and practice and we support action by leaders within the NHS to tackle race, health inequalities. If we do our job right, therefore, the race and health observatory is an excuse removing enabler for the NHS. A new and independent organisation, we are prioritised improving health outcomes for black and ethnic communities within five key areas. Maternity and neonatal health, mental health and wellbeing, and immediate work on the impact of COVID on our diverse communities, including the NHS workforce. The two other areas we are looking at are digital access, beginning with ethnicity data, and also new medicine, genomics and precision medicine. Please don't ask me to explain what precision medicine is. Finally, we are considering the role of how health system is organized and the policies that it puts in place to ensure that we can influence those and ensure that we build in long-term sustainable action. I'm also proud to be the chair of North East London ICS. It's actually the most diverse ICS in the country and I'm committed to mobilising our collective intent and resources to improve access to experience of and outcomes from health and care services, ensuring that we truly do improve population health for all our communities and steadfastly tackle health inequalities. The truth is that we are still currently fashioning our approach and looking in internationally for best practice examples, being led actually by our forward thinking local authorities with a focus on clarity of intent, um, underpinned by embedded evidence and unswerving focus and harness resources, 
in so doing, enabling action and ensuring we have mechanisms in place to hold each other to account for progress. As I return to the theme of this year, Black History Month, I think we all have a lot to be proud of. I hope today we all ask ourselves how we will further forge an impact on history, an impact that will actually create change, whether this be at home, in our neighbourhood, at work or within our social life. It can be as simple as being proud to challenge something discriminatory we see on TV or ensure we are more informed or bringing a colleague into a conversation. I think we all can be proud to be if what we do makes us think a little harder and makes us stretch ourselves a little more in the pursuit of equality. I hope you really enjoy today and I'll try to stay for as long as I can before I have to go to my next meeting. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Marie, and thank you for really setting the scene for this proud to be theme that's going to run through this session. So um, for those of you that were here as we uh, as the session started, you've already heard from Sade Ebony. So during the day, Sade works for Nottingham City Council, but she's also an amazingly talented singer and songwriter. And so if our tech works properly now we're going to play her song heading which for those of you who may wish to do so is available for download on spotify i'm going to hand over to hopefully this uh, hearing from Sade. Future. 
Crikey, that's very hard to follow, isn't it? I think if we were together, there would be there'd be a very loud um, round of applause. So, just to remind you all, that was Sade Ebony. Her song is heading, and it is available for download on Spotify. So that was absolutely lovely. Thank you. So, just to move now to our next live speaker. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Irfan Malik. Um, who some of you will, I'm sure, know. He's a senior partner at a Nottingham GP practice in Sherwood. He's also a senior representative of his local mosque in Snenton. And as well as being a very busy and committed GP, he has a strong passion for military history, including trying to raise awareness of the role of eth ethnic minorities played in the First World War. So I'm going to hand you over to Dr Malik to talk to you about why he is pr proud. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Lucy. Um, and indeed, a, a hard act to, to follow, but I'll try my best. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name uh, is Irfan Malik. Um, I was born and bred in the Meadows area of Nottingham. Uh, my parents migrated from Pakistan in the early 60s. Um, I was very fortunate to end up studying at uh, Birmingham University and qualifying as a doctor a long time ago, 30 years ago. Um, and I'm now working as a senior GP partner at uh, Elmswood Surgery um, in Sherwood, looking after our 9,000 patients. I'm also a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Association and help run uh, Bethel Hafiz Mosque in Snenton. Uh, we're involved in a lot of interfaith events um, and support our local charities as well. We have built up um, very valued partnerships with the Salvation Army Food Bank in Snenton and also the, the, the Royal British Legion as well. Um, and two years ago, before COVID, um, we held an NHS roadshow at our mosque as well, and we partnered with Nottingham University Hospitals and the Bain team there as well. And we had a number of stalls um, in the mosque, um, which was a very good um, uh, event for engaging with the communities around there. Um, and sometimes we, we, we find that certain uh, ethnic minorities or inner city uh, communities are hard to reach, but if people make an effort to to reach out, um, they will get a good response um, and you know widen their their audience there. So seven years ago, um, after researching my family history, um, I developed uh, an interest in the First World War contribution of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, two of my great grandfathers took part in World War One. Uh, my grandfathers were in the Burma campaign in World War Two, um, and were recipients of the Burma Star Medals. Um, they were from a small village called Dulmial in Punjab, in uh, present-day Pakistan, um, which is a, a small place but made major contributions um, in both of the world wars and the village was rewarded um, with a large British cannon in 1925 which still sits there um, as a type of war memorial. Um, over the years this project grew um, and uh, you know I became a, a public speaker on the on the topic traveling the country um, together with my military museum. So I wasn't a historian and I wasn't a teacher either, but I felt it was very important um, to get this message out to as many people as possible. Uh, my work was widely published um, and also covered very well by mainstream media um, also. Um, I've also been um, involved with the Nottingham City Council South Asian Heritage Month celebrations over the last five years. Um, during COVID it didn't happen, but it uh, ran from the month before Black History Month. Um, so my main message uh, with regards to the heritage uh, side of things um, is let's stop 
whitewashing of the world war's history and let's highlight and remember the important contribution of millions of asians africans and west indian troops uh, that have helped us uh, in both of the world wars it's a very important message to get get out um, so in conclusion proud to be so number one i'm proud to be a british muslim I'm proud to be someone who served our NHS for 30 years and still going. Um, and finally, still uh, I'm proud to have, a, have been a part in the div diversifying of World War I history. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Malik. I think um, this event is about inspiring and uniting us, but it's also clearly about us learning. So that was fascinating. Thank you very much for that, um, that presentation. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce to you another musical interlude. So it, we, it will be two specially produced tracks representing our black history from young, talented, Nottingham-based independent artists called Jaya Had a Dream, Plentiful Poet, Amari, and Amari Marsalis and LD. And the two tracks that we're going to pay, play you are called Black Rage and You Own It. So sit back and enjoy. It's a violation. My cousin got locked up guilty by association. Debate his face and address and the paper. Why so blatant? What a nation. We scream it's coming home. When I'm sorry if I don't feel no relation. And check the correlation. We score the goal to celebrating. But when a young black star misses the pen, out comes the basis. Back to that monkey talk. That shit outdated. Stop it with your chanting and allow us to put more rhythm in your anthem. Don't call this shit a tantrum. Cause the way that we get branded equal rights should be a standard. All these stereotypes, they ain't grown how we grown. They don't see what we see or see how we see it. But they still want to judge how we live it. They couldn't walk in my shoes, wouldn't survive one day being black in Britain. God's chosen children, destined for greatness, it was written. Blood of a slave still running through my veins, still riding with the spirits. Runaway tribe couldn't tame my type. History shows it gave us a bad image. We was kings and queens, now our dynasties diminished. My people killing each other and living in prisons. Our mind's a terrible thing to waste, so I keep my vision.
I tried to tell my little sister about her black skin. Tell my younger brother that he's a black king. Never get wrapped in. Stay strong, no adapting. They try to find something to attack when the arguments collapsing. Cause they know that you're the sweetest. Our ancestors, I'm proud. What them elders did is genius. Despite the walls against us, we prosper over weakness. And every black star different. Look at the uniqueness. Wow. Nobody paved the way. I made mistakes. So much rage, I didn't ask for this life. I was living, but I take it day by day. Mom always told me, believe in yourself. Dad told me, hold your head up all the way. I remember the days me and Granny used to pray. She always used to say, Jamaica's a beautiful place. You have to think when our elders pass, our history fades. So what we're doing to keep it in place? Actions are louder than words, and you can't just speak on change, because it's never going to work that way. Yeah. So I tell my little brother, uh, when he's darker than me, uh, I just tell him that he is a king, uh, and I tell him that our mom is a queen, and I tell him he can climb over mountains, despite all these obstacles that are laying down in front of us, that they win every time. Am I meant to stand on one knee to show you I care about my race? Do I need to hold one hand in the air and shout from the rooftop to show you that I respect my brown skin? In the present, I am so unsure of the doors that never got left open or shut after the next generation. I always felt love between you and I, black and white. And I looked myself in the eye and I tried to comprehend my feelings with my own skin. And as I stand in the mirror, I look at my face and I only see one side and it isn't dark. I have lost a lot of love for you and I held my hand out in the dark, but no one picks me up. I have had to find closure and empowerment for my own pain of race and it's tiring. Forcing myself to over explain how I feel about my own race to the people that it's same as me. And then over explain to white people that I have white in me too. In my present, I am trying to be true to both sides of my race. I look myself straight in the face and sometimes I only see one side and most of the time it isn't the side I look. I was raised by Irish blood, but my people, them, they call me blood. Black and white mixed together, it made me up. And only now in my present, I understand the word hard I thought that time had passed, that label don't run anymore. But more than ever in my life, as a mixed race woman, it finally makes sense to me. A word I will not stand for, but the term makes me understand more. I understand why they said half cast. Thank you very much. Um, not just another fantastic musical contribution, but an amazing accompanying video. So uh, thank you very much all for that. Now, I think, Jaya, you've asked if you could just briefly speak. Is that OK if we just hand over to you for one moment? Uh, yeah, I won't be long. Sorry, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can. yes. Sorry. Okay. Um, no, thank you so much. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to the council for bringing me into this um, as a freelancer producing this video. Um, and I just wanted to make sure the artists get credit because uh, there was credits at the end. Um, Plentyful Poet. I've put all the social medias for these artists. Plentyful Poet, LD, Omari, and me, Jaya Had a Dream. If you have any future projects to do with anti-racism, uh, we're all here for it. Um, we do a lot of work around that. So yeah, it's nice that we're connecting the community with more creative art stuff again. Um, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much. And thanks for that signposting. That's great, thank you. So, um, so if we move on now to another live speaker, um, we've got a tremendous lineup here today. So. What I want to do is to introduce Kieran Thompson. Now, Kieran obtained well-deserved recognition when he was named the BBC Get Inspired Unsung Hero Award at Sports Personality of the Year 2019. Kieran runs the community project Helping Kids Achieve in Bullwell in Nottingham City, which you will know is one of our most deprived areas in the city. And Kieran's um, kindly agreed to come today to share some of his experiences in what he now describes as community leadership. So I'm going to hand over to you, Kieran. You're on mute, Kieran.
Hello guys, I'll start that again. Hope you all are well. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me and inviting me to, to this event. Um, so for me, growing up as a, as a young person, you know, it was hard. Um, as a peer, as a as a child to a teenage mother um, in the late eighties, hard for it, you know. Um, and for me, going through a lot of issues, um, obviously not having not having a dad around, um, growing up in a rough neighbourhood um, at the time. Um, and yeah, like my mom raised raising me as a teenage parent, it it, it, w it was difficult, you know. Um, so then that that in indirectly had an impact on myself. Um, and so I, I would go through school, um, go through a lot of mental health issues that weren't really being resolved. And so I, I was always labelled as a naughty kid when I when I was in school. And so these kind of things were never kind of resolved all the way up until secondary and my, my college years. I ended up being permanently excluded when I was in year eleven, and I left school with one GCSE, which was in art and design. And for me, I didn't have a lot of aspirations, you know. Um, I knew that I wanted to be something, but I didn't really know what I truly wanted to become. Um, it wasn't until I was around 17, 18, that things really, I, I really started to evaluate what was going on in my life. Um, when I was 17, I got badly beaten up with baseball bats and glass bottles coming from a house party. And um, at, that, at that time, I was just starting to make that transition into finding out what I truly wanted to do as a, as a career, you know. Um, it didn't, it, it wasn't until I was around um, 18, 19 that I then started to go into like the youth work sector and I volunteered as a youth worker um, for a few months. I was so passionate about wanting to help young people in my community um, and wanting to see a change in, in my community. Um, they, obviously, the people that gave me the chance to volunteer at the time, saw that and that they gave me a, a position as a, as a youth worker. Um, from there, it kind of es escalated and then I started working in a children's home um, for young people with learning disabilities. And I also worked in the children's home for mainstream young people that uh, display challenging behaviours. Um, and I was working there and I was doing all of that for about five years. And then I kind of got disillusioned with it all because I noticed a lot of the times I was just like on the phone to the police um, because that child had either gone missing or they had attacked one of the staff members. And I didn't really feel that I was doing anything called benefit to these young people, if anything, I was criminalising them, um, which is the opposite of my work. Um, and so then I set up my organising Helping Kids Achieve, um, which I felt like this is the best way I know that I can support these young people. Um, and so I set up in 2018, and now we do work in Bullwell. Um, um, St. Anne's, Best Wards, and all across the city doing mentoring with these, these young people um, and giving them alternatives, giving them different referral routes and things that they can do um, and helping them raise their aspirations. For me, I want to be that person that I needed as a, as a young person and that's what, that's what I'm trying to do today is um, trying to inspire these young people um, and give them some hope as I don't believe there's many positive 
black male role models around. Um, and so I want to help help promote that and be the trendsetter for that. And hopefully more more black male role models can can come to light and support our young people in the community because there's a lot of young people that do need our help and support. But we need we need the people, the positive role models, to be out there to to support them. Um, and so so yeah. Um, that's that's my journey, and yeah, I'm just grateful and thankful for all the support that our organisations have been given. Um, so yeah, I think I don't know if that's five minutes or not, but yeah, thank you, Kieran. Thank you very very much, and I think you've just really articulately described in your own words why you should be proud to be you. So thank you, thank you for coming and sharing that. Thank you very much. Um, so just so our next video. Um, so I don't know whether other people will know this, but show racism, the red cards annual wear red day took pl place this year on October the 22nd. That's last week. And Corey Kyle and Kevin De Silva Bastos both play professional football for Loughborough Dynamo Football Club. So we're going to show you a short video called Wear Red Against Racism, Racism in Football. And in this, they share their personal experiences on and off the pitch of the importance of educating people on race and racism and the value of shared humanity. So here, here we go. Hello, I'm Corey, um, and first of all, I just want to say it's great to see all the different organisations coming together um, for more well, racism in football and support Black History Month. Um, I just want to start off by saying I'm half Black Jamaican, um, and obviously proud. Um, yeah, and I just want to speak about difficulties in, in football, especially being um, Black. I think it is it is challenging at times um, because there is a lot of sly racism um, and some direct um, so it's kind of getting over these hurdles and how to address them in the situations um, I'm I'm proud to be me I'm proud of my, my culture and, and my race um, basically I just want to say as well sometimes as a black football you need to be quite resilient, resilient um, because coming against hurdles like if an incident happens in a match say you can't sometimes react out you have to put the trust and hope into the refs and officials to deal with it correctly um, and then you need to kind of bounce back as soon as to kind of carry on with the match per se um, if not then hopefully with the procedures in place it, the match gets abandoned and it gets addressed early on and gets resolved um, so yeah, I just want to say I'm happy for organisations like Kick It Out and things like that that are in place to, to help us on a, a wide scale of things um, and are there for us. But um, yeah, it's like we do we do have challenges at times, um, especially with well, well all over the country, but especially up north sometimes as well, where there's not as many black footballers you, you get it from the fans a lot more um, and which is a bit more difficult to to address because if there's a big group of fans it's it's hard to say oh it was, it was someone um so you, you kind of got to be strict within yourself and like saying put your hope hope the officials and that deal with it correctly um with me i've got one of my players um kev um just to say a few words my name is Kevin Bassos. Um, I'm a black footballer. I'm African, Angolan to be exact, and Portuguese. Um, like Corey said, there's there's a lot of things, not just in football, but in everyday life. But obviously, in football is it's football. You get it more because, like like he said, there's 
you go to places where there's not many people, there's not many um, diversity in people. So, and like you said, it's hard. It's hard to always bite your tongue, and when you when you when you react, now you're the aggressor, and then everything spins on us. But um, we've come a long way, and we're always going to keep rising. And I'm glad that all these organisations are coming together, because the more we sit together, the better it is for us, and the more the more um, we can spread the word. And like you say, not everyone is, and for those good people out there, I'm sorry that people that don't know are not educated are making you look bad but the people that aren't just literally need to be educated because like you say we're, we're all human everyone we all eat the same we all breathe the same everything the same it's just the only thing that is different maybe that color of the skin or our hair and where we where we grew up and where we come from but other than that we, we, as, as such in that way we all have feelings but Nonetheless, I'm glad that we're all coming together, and together we'll be strong. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, very powerful, wasn't it? And, uh, you know, with pride comes resilience, I think, and that's very clear from that video. So um, I'm now delighted to introduce um, the last of our live guest speakers. Um, and it's Professor Harminder Singh Dua, who was a professor of ophthalmology at Nottingham University Hospitals. And he also discovered a new layer of the eye called the Dua layer in 2013. Um, professor Dua is also the, currently the High Sheriff of Nottingham and has undertaken some great work within our BME communities. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Dua, um, who's giving his time to share his personal reflections on my journey my career. Over to you, Professor Dur. Well, good morning and uh, thank you all very much. This is a great event and I'm proud to be part of it. I'm going to share with you a snapshot of my career, my journey through my career and some of my tenets that guided me. I will try and share my presentation, uh, which hopefully will come up in a few seconds. And this uh, presentation is a snapshot of my career with the, my guiding tenets, which can apply to anybody's career through their working life. Life is a summation of the opportunities that present and the choices one makes when those opportunities present. Often opportunities do not present, and in that situation, one should go get them, go find them, not just sit back and wait for those to come. My career has been in the form of a game of snakes and ladders. I started off in India, became a doctor and was almost ready to become a, a professor from reader when this snake got me and I came all the way down to become a senior house officer, which is the starting rung of the ladder in a career post in the UK in Huddersfield. I worked my way up the ladder and then was ready to become a consultant in Aberdeen when this snake got me and I came down to take up a relatively lower post as a fellow in the Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. Like everybody else, we have these ups and downs. But one fine day, I got this long distance call from the University of Nottingham appointing me as the professor and chair of ophthalmology over here. So what I learned was the more snakes you encounter, the greater are your odds of finding the ladder where sky is the limit. Progress is not defined by the title of your post. My mother used to say, Beta, which means son, don't you want to settle in life? You keep moving from city to city, country to country. And I said, no, there's a difference between stagnation and settlement. As long as you are learning, as long as you are progressing, then moving does not matter, no matter what post you are learning in. I learned that education and training are priceless investments with lifelong dividends. And I say to my children, avail as many opportunities to learn as you can. And learning is a lifelong process. It does not end with your acquisition of a qualification or a degree. It continues in many ways, it starts at that point. 
One of the most important quotations which I have found to guide me through my career has been this, to ask a question is the beginning of learning, to answer the question is a test of knowledge, but to question the answer is the start of wisdom. And as a chairperson said, we asked many questions, we answered them and we questioned our own answers till it culminated in this research award, the Times Higher Education Research Award across all universities in the UK, across all disciplines. It was for the research project of the year, and this was in 2013-14, and it was uh, proudly presented by the university at the entrance of every site in the city. The Times Higher Education Research Project of the Year Award, which is awarded to the individuals and to the university. Peer recognition comes in many forms, but recognition comes in many forms, but peer recognition is the highest form of recognition. You will find that your teachers will appreciate you, your students will appreciate you, but when your colleagues who are effectively your competitors, they appreciate you, then you have really arrived. And it came to me in various forms of which I highlighted the president of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. But one which is not so prominent is also being an executive member of a multilingual poetry group. Now, language is something we don't talk about much, but there is a invisible line it draws between people of different languages. And language and bringing people of different languages together brings communities together and widens your horizons. And that I found was very important and a key to some of the successes. And of course, as, as mentioned, the High Sheriff of Nottinghamshire, which is my current post for one year, and I'm halfway through it. And in this, like in my other posts I held, the important bit is not holding the post, but what you do in that post, how you make a difference in that post. And for me, as High Sheriff, the acronym I have adopted is CARE, Community, Environment and Religion, Care for Those We Serve and Care for Those Who Serve Us. Very important that that will be my theme from now on in my lifetime, not just in this one year as High Sheriff. And I have two charities, Real Lives, a mental health charity in Nottingham and the British Ecological Society, which I support. Don't achieve for reward, but don't hesitate to pick up your award, which means that if you have to apply for an award you think you deserve, <coughs> excuse me, don't hesitate to apply. Otherwise, you'll never get it. And that's something I found that people in the BME group don't do a lot of, are not very good at. And think in terms of beginnings, not endings. That's what I've always done. Every ending provides an opportunity for a new beginning. When you finish something, think, move on, what next? And lastly, pay back, give back. You can never pay back the debt you owe to your parents and teachers. This is one debt each generation owes to the previous generation and pays back to the next by doing for your children and your students what your teachers and parents did for you. Take your family along. And lastly, always pursue perfection, but never assume you are perfect. Perfection is an illusion. The achievement is in the pursuit of perfection. The day you think you are perfect, you will have become complacent. Thank you and have an enjoyable journey towards perfection. I mentioned languages. Languages are important. And I just close with this couplet I wrote. All humans, no human can speak all languages no matter what they try, all humans speak one language when they laugh or cry. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Dewar. That was fabulous. And uh, again, a theme here about learning and wisdom, and, and that is, of course, the antidote to ignorance. And we know that ignorance is, drives much of racism. So that's fabulous. Thank you very much for that. So, um, Moving on to our next video, um, this is a video from Richard Stubbs. Richard Stubbs is the Chief Executive Officer at Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Sciences Network, and he's also the Vice Chair of the 
AHSN network of networks. He's a national influencer in diversity and inclusion, and he's worked in EDI for many years, with, and he is very highly regarded for his work. He's also written numerous articles for top health and care journals, as well as national case studies. So we're now going to um, have his personal reflections on how diversity helps to understand cultural needs. Thank you. Hello, my name is Richard Stubbs. I am the Chief Executive of the Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network. And I'm also the Vice Chair of the AHSN Network, which is the national body that oversees the work of all 15 AHSNs across England. Academic Health Science Networks are here primarily to support the spread and adoption of health innovation rapidly and at scale throughout the NHS. We do that to rapidly change the way that we can deliver care for our patients, and also we do that to support the development of economic growth from within the UK by growing the innovation sector and creating high value jobs for our region. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you today um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about this topic. I'm actually really always delighted to talk about my personal passion and mission to increase diversity within our R&D and innovation spaces. But that is especially true during Black History Month. And as I'm sure you are all aware, the theme for Black History Month this year is proud to be. I am really proud to be a chief executive of an AHSN. I am quite biased, but I do think it's one of the best jobs in the NHS. But I'm also proud to be the, ch the, the chair of the steering group of the NHS Confederation's BME Leadership Network. And that's a network that's there to support and elevate the voices of our ethnic minority leaders in the NHS at all levels. So please do look us up on the NHS Confederation website. And if you're interested, join as an ethnic minority leader or as an ally. And I look forward to seeing you in network meetings in the future. So what I want to talk to you about today is something that um, I'm really proud to have originated a few years ago. Um, the origin story to this work is really, I think, um, rooted in the fact that I've been in the NHS now for far more years than I care to remember and throughout that time have always been involved in equality, diversity and inclusion issues. I think in the NHS we often tend to focus quite rightly on the representation um, within our frontline staff and then also uh, our leadership levels, so Roger Klein's snowy white peaks. But after being in the innovation role in, in various different organisations for, for about 10 years, I started to realise that actually I personally haven't put those two agendas together and that I didn't see anybody really doing any work on what the importance of great diversity within our R&D sectors looks like and our innovation spaces and why the business case to that could be quite uh, important to the way that we deliver patient care. So I started to do some work on that and I started to, um, to, to read and to write about what that business case potentially looks like but also started to think very long and deep about the, the gatekeeping role that is often played by people who sit in the innovation or improvement space. It's gatekeeping in terms of the types of people who traditionally go into those roles. It's gatekeeping in terms of acceptance onto programmes such as our, our NHS National Innovation Accelerator programme. But it's also gatekeeping in terms of um, uh, selecting and prioritising the kinds of demands and the kinds of needs that the NHS is seeking to, um, to identify. Um, so what are the challenges that we set ourselves in our innovation and improvement spaces? What are the challenges set by our colleagues in the National Institute for Health Research, perhaps? And are we confident that we have a diversity of thought, both within those roles, but also within the way that those roles and those programmes are influenced, that's going to ensure that the efforts and the, the, the resources that we put into how we create uh, changes for the future are going to be changes that are going to improve the lives for all our populations and increasingly seek to reduce and not widen health inequalities. And that business case is really clear. We probably all know that um, you know, almost 20% of the staff within the NHS identify as ethnic minority. 
Um, what I'm really fond of saying is that, simply put, if we don't in ensure that every member of the staff within the NHS has the ability to access the innovation pipeline, has the ability to bring their ideas forward in a way that's not just going to create change in their locality, but going to lift that idea to something which can be deployed at national level, then the NHS is quite simply turning its back on one fifth of the potential ideas that have the capacity to transform the way that we deliver care. We also know, and this isn't specific to healthcare, but that any team with a diversity, any team where, where a member of that team shares an ethnicity with a particular client or customer, or in our case, patient, the entire team is 152% more likely to understand that, that client or that patient. So the evidence is out there, it's really obvious that diversity within teams, diversity of thought leads to much better outcomes, it leads to much better experience. I think we all know this. The mission that I've taken on is to think, how can I apply that knowledge to my world of innovation, technology, working with industry and seeking to bring um, game changing improvements into the NHS. And I thought it was really important that before I did anything, you know, we have to start with ourselves. So as HSNs, I was really proud that every board of every HSN in the country committed to deliver some pledges that we created ourselves to hold ourselves to account for the way that we identify and nurture innovation and the innovators behind them, both inside and outside the NHS. So this is about how we ensure that we are exemplar organisations. It's about how we ensure that we're exemplar employers. But perhaps most crucially, it's about how we look again at the work that we do with fresh eyes and start to identify where we are helping on this agenda and where we are hindering this agenda and what actions we need to take in order to be able to improve that. And we've had the pledges in place now for, for just over 12 months. We've already seen huge changes and um, uh, improvements in the outcomes that we're delivering. We've seen improvements in the representation and the applications to uh, big flagship programs like our NHS Innovation Accelerator and other things. And I'll be publishing a report early next year, which just sets out some of our early findings from the work of adopting these, these pledges. And I'm really blessed to be joined across the entire network by colleagues who have come together to help me to deliver this agenda. So what we have now is a really mobile um, and energised team who come together to support each other to deliver our pledges, but also I think crucially to think about how we can really start to promote and um, embed the concept of why greater diversity innovation is so important to our, our patients. And I think particularly thinking about um, uh, COVID-19 and the stark in health inequalities that were, that were shown, I think um, we have an even greater role to play especially I think around digital and making sure that anything we do around digital technologies seeks to um, reduce and not widen health inequalities. And when it comes to digital inclusion, I think that's a really, really crucial thing to always keep in mind. The other thing we want to do, and I think this is so, so important, and speaking as an ethnic minority NHS leader, um, this is crucial to me. We have to be able to champion and find role models. And I think that's particularly true in our innovator community. Um, I very deliberately spent a lot of time um, in the first year of this work really identifying and lifting and platforming and championing some amazing innovators from BAE backgrounds. Innovators who are from within the NHS and from um, health and care uh, wider, but also from industry as well. But talking about their personal experiences, their heritage and their journeys and how it's all shaped their work and their outlook and crucially, their innovations. Um, I think there's something about the lived experience of these innovators, which almost um, by default bakes in um, elements to their work, which seeks to make sure that they're engaging with all communities. It seeks to make sure that their, their work helps to reduce and not widen health inequalities. And I think for me, that's part of the business case about why this is so important. And if you download our report, you'll see stories from all these innovators talking about why that's important to them and how their journeys have influenced their decision making and their, their roles as innovators, both inside and outside the system. But I'm not stopping there. So we've done some great work over the last 12 months. I think I'm pretty confident in saying the HSN Network really owns and understands this space and is committed 
to delivering our pledges over the long term. But now that we've, um, I suppose, looked at ourselves quite um, 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 in a focused manner, I'm now thinking about what's next. And so I'm working with the wider health and life science industry. Um, so people like the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industries, the Association of British Health Tech um, Industries. Basically, our entire life science, uh, pharma, med tech, digital and diagnostics communities and large companies to say, if we think about what Lewis Hamilton is doing in Formula One around his Mission 44, which is how, how does he start to champion um, groups from underrepresented communities who aren't yet currently working in science, engineering, and particularly in the Formula One supply chain. What would it look like if we started to create something that we did together and led together that was of the same um, of the same goal? So I'm using Mission 44, Lewis's work, as my inspiration to start to have a conversation nationally about what our health and life science sector would achieve if we created that same ambition together. And you'll hopefully see the QR code on the screen and the link to a, to a Microsoft Forms, or you can just email me. But I'm really keen to have that conversation with people, to bring everyone together under one umbrella to say we're all working in this space individually. If we all put our efforts together as well, what could we create in terms of transforming the way that um, um, access to, to roles, senior roles within innovation and improvement are created, but also that we start to really recognise what the lived experience of people from diverse backgrounds brings to transformation if we really open that door as wide as possible. So thank you very much for listening. Um, again, I'm so sorry I can't be there with you live today, but hopefully if you, any of this has piqued your interest, do look at our work. Um, the website's address is there. Follow the hashtag HSN Diversity to see some of the um, examples of what we're doing on Twitter. And as always, um, if anybody wants to talk about this in more detail, please do get in touch. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Fabulous. Thank you again. Another great presentation there. Um, so um, this is this is where our um, session is. We're moving into our last third of the session and it's about to become a little bit more interactive. So I'm now going to hand over to Ryan Knight and Taraj Singh, who are going to run a quick um, quiz. Um, and we hope this will be separating the no's from the no nots. Um, obviously, the, the, the focus is on black history, uh, no competition, but just do your best. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you for the introduction. Um, just again, my name is Ryan Knight. I work for Not Self Care. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to just say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I've enjoyed the day so far and we've heard some brilliant presenters, um, some very inspirational speakers. Um, I hope you all agree. Um, should we get straight into the quiz, Tarage? Yep, absolutely. Just to say hello again. Uh, my name's Taraj. I am um, Equalities Lead for Nottinghamshire County Council um, and we can crack on with it. I hope you've all got on with um, getting to the link. Um, I'll pass it over to Ryan. Yeah, so in your chat bar, um, there's a link that you can click on to that will take you straight to the Kahoot website. Um, you can either click on the link or you can copy and paste the link into your browser. Um, on the screen, you should see, oh, well, I can see a few names popping up at the moment. Tallulah, Quizzing Nurse, Foxy Loxy. We've got some great names. Um, so on the screen, you'll see at the top of the page, there's a, a game pin. Once you've clicked onto the link, um, you just need to insert the game pin um, and click OK, and you should be entered into the quiz once you've selected your quiz name. So I'll just give you a few minutes just to get a few people joined onto there. Just to mention that I absolutely loved the presentations, the music, it's just been so brilliant. And I think just continuing with the proud to be, um, I think something that I'm really proud of is being from the Sikh community. Um, Early on, there was some chat about contribution to world war and there has been in the past recent well it's it's been recent actually um kind of promotion or you know just raising awareness of the Sikh soldiers in in uh, in the wars and there's actually a dedicated poppy for especially for Sikh soldiers it's the it's kind of a, a double-edged sword 
um, that's the representation. But yeah, absolutely brilliant speakers. This is such a good and you know interesting session. I can see lots more um, people joining the Kahoot quiz. That's brilliant. Love the names. My bets are on clever clogs. That sounds <laughs> like a smart name to me. <laughs> I quite like QS. That's quite mysterious. Yeah. Don't know who that is, but it sounds good. <laughs> Right, so we'll just give you a couple more minutes because I think we are trying to make a little bit of time back up. So we want to um, try and keep to the time of the agenda as much as we can. Um, but obviously we want to give you all the opportunity to get into the quiz. <laughs> yeah, the way we're going to do it is um, Ryan's going to kick off with the questions and then I'll do a few questions and we'll just swap. Mm -hmm. I believe also, I'm not sure whether what the the prize is but i believe there's some form of a prize in a in a certificate form so get your competitive hats on um because there's a certificate up for grabs as well guys <laughs> uh, i'm not sure if that's everyone do you think we're Catherine, do you know how many we've got on the on the call at the moment? Sorry, I can't see that. I'm just wondering whether we make a start with the quiz. It's showing we've got 16 on at the moment. Yeah, good to go, Ryan. Lovely. Right, so we'll um, we'll kick you off. Um, so question number one, pens at the ready. <laughs> Who said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere? Martin Luther King, Jr. Martin Luther King. Luther Vandross or Luther? And you've got 20 seconds to answer. <laughs> I think we've um, we've got 11 answers. We had 16 people on, so I think we had five people that didn't get the chance to vote then. But don't worry, you'll get a chance to vote on the next one. Um, looks as though most people did select the right answer, which was Martin Luther King Jr. So well done to those people. Uh, on to the next question, please, Scott. Oh, we've got a leaderboard there. Was that Liv that I saw at the top? So you're on to question two at the moment. So again, you've got 20 seconds to answer. Eleanor Powell, Mary Seacole, Agnes Kamalegia, uh, JK Aka. Brilliant. So again, we've got um, a lot of people getting the uh, the questions right. So we've got 13 responses that came in correct there and the correct answer was Mary Seacole. Um, can we just have a, have we got a look at the leaderboard again for us, Scott? Oh, so Liv's been knocked off the top now and we've got Sade right at the top. So um, Sade is leading for the certificate at the moment. <laughs> On to the uh, next question, please, Scott. Who was the first black football player to captain the England team? John Barnes, Des Walker, Paul Ince or Viv Anderson? Oh. So not so many right on that question. We had 11 people um, answering correctly on that one. We only had two that got the correct answer, which was Paul Ince. Um, great, let's have a look at the leaderboard, please, Scott. So Sade was at the top and she's now been knocked off by Tallulah. OK, let's, um, let's see how this quiz goes on. Uh, Tarij, do you want to take over the next few questions? Yes, thank you, Ryan, brilliant. Okay, no um, so the fourth question, please. 
So the fourth question is, in London in 1960, 1966, sorry, a carnival took place, which became an annual event. But where was it in London? The answers are below. You've got Notting Hill, Camden, Hackney, Islington. So you've got, you've got now eight seconds to reply. You can see we've got quite a few more answers in now. Yes, well, not, Notting Hill was the right answer. Well done. And let's have a look at the leaderboard. We've got Tallulah still at the top. That's brilliant. I think we might need to investigate Tallulah. I think so. I think there's yeah. some strategy going on here. Yeah, yeah. Going on. <laughs> OK, can we have the next question, please? Brilliant. OK, what is the next line in this Bob Marley song? We all know the song. It's don't worry about a thing. But is it because every little thing is going to be OK? Is it good at the end? Is it all right? Or is it smashing? Just sing it to yourself in your head or you can take yourself off mute if you want. Oh, we've got the answers in and yes, it is. Everything's going to be all right. 14 got the answer correct. Let's have a quick look at the leaderboard. Right, Tallulah is still at the top. I think we need to get investigation going here. Yeah, that wasn't a surprise, right. that one, Tarridge. I was sort of expecting that again, yeah. Third time in a row. Let's see if she goes for a fourth. <laughs> Let's have the next question. OK, which island nation, capital Port Louis, is situated in the Indian Ocean around 2000 kilometres off, e off the eastern coast of Africa? So you've got your answers there. Ten seconds to reply. You've got Jamaica, Java, Tobago and Mauritius. Twelve answers in. Got 13 answers in now. And yes, it is Mauritius. Well done. Excellent. Oh, brilliant. We've uh, we've, we've got Tallulah out. Yeah, we've knocked Tallulah's confidence. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> OK, pass it over to yourself, Ryan. Brilliant. Uh, can we go to the next question, please, Scott? Who said, don't count the days, make the days count? Was it Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Rosa Parks or Nat Turner? And you've got 10 seconds to answer from now. Great, so we've got seven people that got the right answer. I've got about eight that got incorrect answers, but but that's OK. We'll uh, we'll move on to see the leaderboard, please, Scott, just to check to see who's at the top now. And Tallulah's pushing second place, but Sade is confidently up there with 5,193 points. Can we move on to the next question, please, Scott? Why is the port of Tilbury in Essex significant in British black history? It's where Mary Seacole was born. Britain's first Caribbean shop was opened here. This was the first town where black people were allowed to enter the shops. It's where the Empire Windrush ship docked in 1948. Great. Most people got the correct answer to that one. So we got 10 people. Uh, let's have a look at the leaderboard, please, Scott. Great, and we've still got Sade up there, increased on the points now, 5,800, touching 6,000 points. Um, Sade is definitely hunting for that certificate. Uh, let's keep going. On to the next question, please, Scott. Who was the first African dancer on BBC Strictly Come Dancing? Oti Mabus, Johannes Radebe, Cameron Lombard, or Mutsi Mabuse.
And we've got 13 people that got the correct answer there. So let's take another look at the leaderboard, please, Scott. Great, so we've got a few mixture of names. We've got Sade still sitting at the top, Andre second, Foxy Loxy third. Unfortunately, Clever Clogs is nowhere to be seen. I thought that name would be near the top. Right, let's... Uh... I'm kind of thinking, where's QS as well? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I believe that's on to you now, Tarij, if you want to uh, go through the next few questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, no we might is. miss out the leaderboard um, just because we're just, uh, we just want to get everything done on time, but there will be leaderboard at the end. So can we have the next question, number 10, please? Excellent. So, comic release, well, comic relief, sorry, was launched in 1985. But which comedian founded it? You've got your answers there below. You've got Stephen K. Ars. You've got uh, Lenny Henry. Um, there's Richard Blackwood, and there's Charlie Williams. So, who founded it? Yes, it was Lenny Henry. Excellent. Brilliant. Only one person that got it wrong. OK, so if we quickly can we move on? So, yeah, question 11. In 2003, the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama needed a scholarship after named, sorry, a scholarship. But after which singer was it Dame Shirley Bassey? Was it um, I'm, I'm going to say Koya and then Brenda Fassi and Yemi Alade? Apologies if I've pronounced any of the names wrong. It was Dame Shirley Bassey, excellent. And can we have the last question, please? So this is this is the last question. So which British Bajan actor once sectioned under the Mental Health Act hosted the BBC documentary Psychosis and Me? Was it David Harwood, Denzel Washington, um, Idris Elba or Daniel Kaluuya? So look at the answer. It was David Harwood. OK, so that's the end of our quiz. Let's see how we've done. Oh, third place, Foxy Loxy. Oh, Andre. Yeah, second place, Andre. And the first, let's see who it's going to be. It's got to be Sade. It's got to be. Oh, yes. Sade, well done. <laughs> Excellent. You can really tell that you wanted that certificate. <laughs> Oh, wow. 9,391 points. Well done. Excellent. Yeah. Well done, everyone, for the for contributing to that. You all done really well. Mm. We're going to pass it back over. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tarej and you. Uh, Ryan for that. I think you were all winners, so I'm not going to I'm not going to participate in any ranking. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. And thank you for running that. Thank you. Um, so um, to finish. Uh, this bit of the session um, before I hand over to colleagues to formally close. Um, we have had a theme, haven't we, of uh, music? So um, given that this is a celebration, um, colleagues are keen that we have the opportunity to join together in song. To underline the importance of a shared humanity, regardless of diversity, the song that's been chosen this year is Lean On Me. Now, I, my, my instructions tell me here, please do join in when this song uh, starts to play. Um, and if your camera allows you, please switch it on. But I have got underlined, please do put yourself on mute. Um, so here we go. Thank you.
Apologies. Sorry. Thank you very much. What another fantastic musical contribution. Um, now, we are just about to run slightly late, which I don't think is bad, given what a fantastic session we've had. So before I ask Rosa to close, I'm just going to hand over to Giles and Catherine, who are who have done such a lot of hard work behind the scenes for this. So the ICS EDI leads and they're going to give a very brief overview of plans for the future in terms of the ICS Race Equality Steering Group and a new ICS BME BAME staff network. So over to you, Giles and Catherine. Thank you, Lucy, and uh, thank you, everybody. It's been absolutely fantastic. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so I'm Giles Max. I'm the head of uh, EDI at Nottingham University Hospitals, and Catherine is the associate director and for EDI at Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust. And together, we are the ICS EDI leads, and we uh, are so pleased to be able to present this event to you. Thank you to the hard work of everybody involved. Now, one of our colleagues has compiled a list of further Black History Month events uh, that you can take part in and I'm about to put that uh, link into the chat so if you have a look on there you'll see a whole list of other things that you can do to continue uh, the celebration. So I hand over to Catherine and thank you. So thanks Giles and yes it's been a fantastic event and I don't know about you but I've really enjoyed it. So as Lucy said, we have got a race equality steering group, which is working to drive race equality through the integrated care system. And it is attended by ND leads, but also network leads from all of the ICS organisations. Below that, we're setting up a BIM or BME staff network, which means that from time to time, all of our networks can come together. But the last thing I want to say today is that we wish to dedicate in behalf of the planning group, this Black History Month event, to our friend, colleague and EDI champion, Veronica Price Job, who sadly passed away at the end of September. So this event is for Veronica. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for that. So um, I am now going to hand over to my colleague, Rosa Waddingham, um, who I'm sure will introduce herself, but she's the chief nurse for the Nottinghamshire CCGs and all the also the ICS. I'm just going to say that like like me, Rosa is rarely stuck for words, um, but I have been left speechless actually by today's session. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you very much for listening and over to you, Rosa. Ooh, still on mute, Rosa. This is not what we need, is it, right? <laughs> Just. OK. Oh, looks like. You're not able to get in. Um, well, I could certainly never cover for Rosa, but I am going to close and say thank you, everybody. Um, I have learned so much today. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, ho I'm sure that the organisers will share with everybody that's participated all of the materials that, that, that have been shared. So it really is thank you to me and thank you to everybody um, because this is very much about all of us. And I very much hope I get to see you all again next year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lucy. Bye. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, everybody. And uh, we hope to see you again next year. Remember the events uh, that you can also take part in in the link and see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.